These homes could be in your town. This school could be down your street. And these kids could be your neighbors. But these homes and schools and families are at ground zero in Chicago's fight against violent crime. Inside the front lines. Chicago has a national reputation for violent crime, but most of that crime is concentrated in small and isolated areas of the city, making it all too easy for others here to dismiss it as happening somewhere else to someone else. I'm Rob Stafford. In this special report, NBC5 Investigates takes you inside these dangerous neighborhoods to uncover the enormous challenges for the people who must live here. We'll also give you an exclusive look at some new high-tech methods used by the police who fight the crime here. And we investigate the problems that persist here. We begin with a family whose kids want to ride their bikes and play at the park just like anyone else, but who live in a community where kids can no longer be kids. Here's Tammy Leiter. The sun is not even up and Corey and Stacy Ellis already have their kids on the move. Their six-year-old Miles, 11-year-old Marshall, and Marcel, a high school freshman. Yeah. Corey and Stacy both work full-time, yet they have another full-time job, carefully scripting nearly every moment of their kids' days, like a well-orchestrated symphony. They play basketball, baseball, football. Everything's structured because they can't do the simple things that most kids and parents take for granted. I wish they could walk to the store. I wish they could walk to White Castles. I wish you could walk to school. It would be nice. It would be nice, but Corey and Stacy Ellis go to great lengths to keep their boys from doing those things because they live here in Chicago's Roseland neighborhood on the south side. It's ground zero in a virtual war zone of crime that no child should have to navigate. NBC5 Investigates took some of the basic kid things most families take for granted, playing outside, getting fast food, walking to school and then dug through Chicago's crime reports to see what they would be like for Marcel, Marshall, and Miles. We found that within a block of the Ellis' home, there have been dozens of violent crimes in the past year, including 12 with guns, 36 incidents of assault and battery, and 10 armed robberies. There were also four arrests for crack and heroin and three for sex crimes, all within this one block in one year. Up the street, it's no better. Yeah, taking a chance coming over here. Yeah, even just to get a sandwich, you're taking just a chance? Get a sandwich, yeah. This hoagie shop is along the route Marcel would take if he were allowed to walk to school. Would it surprise you to know that there was an armed robbery in this neighborhood? No. How about that people were arrested with guns? In fact, NBC5 Investigates found 26 armed robberies and more than 200 incidents of assault and battery out of more than 300 violent crimes in the past year, just along Marcel's route to school. Think about that. A violent crime for nearly every day of the year on your child's route to school. I don't know if what happens in impoverished communities is fully understood by the masses. Activist Stephen Gates describes these neighborhoods as having invisible boundaries that kids can't cross, whether it's from violence, drugs, or gangs. For me, it has a third world country feel, and I've had other people uh, second that, that, they, that it felt like these kids were living in a wartime or a third world country. But it's simply a way of life for many Chicago area kids, where even the neighborhood playground is off limits. In fact, it was a neighborhood park where one of Marcel's friends and teammates was gunned down. He wasn't the intended target. You know, it really didn't hit him at first, but we were just driving one day and he just was looking out the window and he just started crying. But Miles, Marshall and Marcel don't want your pity. They simply want to be kids. I kind of wish I could kind of hang out with not, with, without my parents worrying about my safety. Stacy and Corey Ellis are saving up to buy a home and move out to a safer neighborhood, away from the front lines. But those lines can also keep people inside these poor and dangerous neighborhoods, simply because there's nowhere else to go. NBC5 Investigates found that's often the case for the tens of thousands of inmates released each year from Illinois prisons. Here's Carol Marine. 
Chicago, we talk about it being separated by gangs, right? But no, it's separated by zip codes. So which zip codes did ex-offenders land in last year? The largest group, 1,570, went to zip code 60608, which includes parts of Bridgeport and Pilsen. This map shows the highest concentrations of inmates released last year, from 60628 on the far south side to a corridor along the Eisenhower Expressway running from Lawndale to Austin, where hundreds of ex-offenders returned to the pockets of poverty they left. This is the Austin neighborhood, zip code 60651, where last year 616 released inmates came to live. We've come here to talk to eight recently released men whose crimes range from burglary to retail theft to DUI. Eight men with one story about finding a job. Do people ask if you're an ex-offender? Yes, they do. And what happens then? Well, um, I never get a call. Joseph Summers got an interview at a subway. I try to tell him, you know, you know, I don't get a lot of second chances, so I'm going to try harder, harder than maybe the guy that never been in trouble. But no and job. Just... It's the box that often beats them. Check off, yes or no, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Once you check that box, you would be guaranteed that your application would be in the trash and you will not get a call. Though that is changing now. State Representative LaShawn Ford successfully fought to have the box removed from initial applications for state jobs. And a law will soon go into effect in Illinois banning the box in most private businesses. It was a narcotics charge that sent Mark Mitchell to prison decades ago. Now he has four college degrees. And you can't find a full-time job? No, ma'am. But you've been out for 20 years. Doesn't mean anything. Even though I've been home 30 years, if I go and seek employment, I still got to check the box. If employer can actually tell any one of those people, I don't hire uh, people with criminal records, I find that to be very discriminatory. At this Safer Foundation Center, 385 IDOC inmates are being taught skills in order to find employment and increase their education. 38% of Illinois inmates tested last year by the Department of Corrections had math and reading skills below a sixth grade level. Here in Illinois, the state offers tax incentives for hiring ex-offenders, and the city is increasing its second chance initiative, and the CTA has an ex-offenders apprentice program. And in the Chicago Lawn neighborhood, as the Chicago Reporter notes, a marching band trumpeted the opening of a rehabbed house where ex-offenders will live and try to find work, even as the stigma of incarceration remains. Why wouldn't you give a person a chance who has changed his life? I'm not that person any longer. When we come back, an exclusive look at the Chicago Police Department's new methods to combat the constant violence they face inside the front lines. We continue our examination inside Chicago's front lines by looking at the police who confront the violence here every day. NBC5 Investigates got exclusive access to some new state-of-the-art methods, which police hope will make a major impact on the high levels of crime in some of Chicago's most dangerous neighborhoods. We have two reports, beginning with Phil Rogers. Veteran cops will always tell you that when it comes to solving crimes, every second counts. So this is citywide. We're looking at open calls to 911. NBC5 Investigates was given an exclusive first look at the Chicago Police Department's new Crime Prevention Information Center, a high-tech control room deep inside police headquarters, which serves as a conduit to put intelligence information into the hands of officers on the street. You used to have to wait maybe a couple hours for this information to come about. Now they can get it immediately. It's all here in real time, from snapshots of every crime in progress to the exact location of every police asset in the city. What are we seeing up here? So they, these are real-time uh, surveillance video uh, images. Officers in the CPIC can take control of any of more than 25,000 cameras deployed citywide. If the cameras recognize an offender, his mugshots can pop up here. And when a shooting occurs, instant intelligence information is available to show a victim's criminal history, places he has committed crimes, even friends who might retaliate. And this helps us get ahead of the crimes of where they're going to happen and where we should deploy our people. It's all designed to put information in the hands of police where they need it and when they need it. 
we can actually uh, deploy our people and help with investigations and help with the, with the officers in the street with this technology. And the idea is to be doing this as it happens? As it's happening, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is Marion Brooks. Any evidence from any crime scene in Chicago is brought here to the Chicago Police Department's evidence lab. We're given victims closure. We're given families closure. Let's start with ballistics. Any gun from a crime scene meticulously scrutinized. Technicians fire guns into water and a gun room and want the casings. That's where the gun identification happens. The best marked casings go here into the Integrated Ballistics Identification System, or IBIS, brand new to the CPD. And now we're basically going to put the cartridge into the cartridge case holder. The simple task of being able to load this casing themselves is a really big deal. They used to have to send casings to the state police, who had the only IBIS system, and it would then join the casings from departments all around the state, waiting for matches from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives. We wouldn't get results back for months sometimes. And now CPD sends the info to ATF themselves. This basically can be done within five hours from start to finish. Police believe the IBIS system alone is a game changer. What good is information a year later? You know, you need that information when you have a, a person of interest that you're talking to. And there's more. The things you see on those forensic crime shows happen here every day. But they're using actual equipment we use in our laboratory. IDing fingerprints. It's a process. First, the technicians look for prints with a naked eye. Then they get a super glue treatment. Super glue gently heats up, and when it gets to a boiling point, it off gases and creates a white, semi permanent plastic residue. The evidence is then dusted, stained, and then ready to come here. The final step so the technicians can best see these prints, you need a special light and a special filter, like on these glasses and on our lens. The prints become more pronounced. Without the filter, not so much. When photographed, they become even clearer. It's so much easier for the examiner now to work with it. And then there's the Leica station, L-E-I-C-A, a brand name. It's basically a mapping system that allows evidence text to duplicate a crime scene virtually, creating 3D and photographic blueprints of the scene. Instead of taking one measurement at a time, it takes millions of measurements at one time. They can even import the crime scene photos and map them on the scene. The magazine was found here and marked the crime scene marker number 14. Now it's an all digital presentation captivating, keeping the attention of the jury. Very powerful evidence. And these texts do go to court, explaining their work as part of the job, a job they seem to love. It's very exciting, very rewarding. This is crime fighting from the lab. Even with these new resources, Chicago still has some serious problems in fighting crime inside these front lines. And that's where NBC5 Investigate steps in. We'll show you when we come back. Welcome back to our examination of the epidemic of violence inside Chicago's front lines. Over the past year, NBC5 Investigates has uncovered some serious problems in these crime-ridden neighborhoods. And we've gotten results from changing the way criminals are monitored across the entire city to shining a light on the problems of a single block. Here's Chris Coffey with the first of two of our investigations. That little bit of light you see are people's homes. Imagine walking alone on a block like this where it's hard to see even a few feet in front of you. That's what prompted some Southside residents to reach out to NBC5 Investigates, hoping we could shed some light on the dangers of the dark. When the lights go off, the shooting starts, and then the next thing you know, some, here's the police. Ramona Burwell lives in Englewood. The crime rate here is one of the highest in Chicago. She says a big problem is people who disable the lights. It's frayed wiring in there and they just reach up in it and pull it down. So because, there was a metal plate here yes, a week ago? Yes, mm -hmm, a week ago. CDOT says it makes repairs yeah, as quickly as possible, but Burwell says the lights were out when tragedy struck her block last year. Four men were shot inside a car at 73rd and Laughlin. Two of the men were killed. In fact, CDOT commissioned a study that proves what many fear. When streetlights go out, crime goes up. The most prevalent included theft, narcotics, 
battery, criminal damage. Northwestern PhD student Zach Seaskin helped crunch the study's numbers. Where you have multiple street lights affected down a block. If you look in the block where that kind of outage occurs, on average you see a 7% increase in the crimes we were looking at. The lights are out again. Residents here in Bronzeville say they want to prevent those crimes. But this video shows what neighbors on South King Drive have complained about for months. We can't just assume our lights are going to be on anymore. NBC5 investigates examined 311 service records and discovered that residents here notified the city about their block street light outages at least 12 times in one six month period. We complain all the time. We've complained repeatedly. Sometimes the lights are off three consecutive nights. CDOT tells us it makes repairs here but says the area is prone to frequent power outages. It makes you wonder why here? ComEd says power outages are actually down in the entire ward. We stopped by on a good night, the street lights were on. But neighbors say danger may be lurking in the shadows. And the CDOT study shows it takes on average about five days to make street light repairs. The city says it will now make repairing full blocks of non-working lights a priority. This is Phil Rogers. It all started with an exceptionally brutal attack. A 24-year-old student from Chicago State University, four months pregnant, carjacked this fall at Knife Point, then assaulted here in the 9800 block of South Indiana. Sexually assaulted her, then forced her in a trunk. It was the news of the day, and for many stories about Chicago violence, that's where it would end. But NBC5 Investigates decided to take a closer look at the suspect arrested for this assault. And what we found ended up changing the entire system of how violent offenders are monitored in the Cook County Juvenile Courts. In the case of the CSU assault, police immediately arrested 17-year-old Aaron Parks, who at the time was awaiting sentencing on an armed robbery conviction. He'd also recently been charged as a juvenile in a previous carjacking of this woman, Gwendolyn Davis, who told us she was only able to escape by ramming a police squad car near 73rd and Ada. I tried to give him my keys, my phone, everything. He didn't want nothing. He wanted me. Following that attack, Parks was supposed to be confined to his home on electronic monitoring while he awaited trial, raising questions about how he could have left home undetected to allegedly commit such a violent assault. I would like to know how did this get so far where you don't know where someone is that has electronic ban on their leg. NBC5 investigates pulled Park's court records, which indicated he was allowed a few exceptions for school, medical attention, or religious services. On the day of the attack, which Park still says he did not commit, his mother, who asked that we not show her face, told us she thought he was here mile and a half from his home registering for classes at Olive Harvey College. In fact, police say he was a mile in the opposite direction, abducting and assaulting the young victim. When he leaves, they should pick that up because he's no longer in my home and that's where his monitor he's supposed to be at. And it didn't, it didn't happen. When we started asking questions, the probation officer assigned to monitor Parks was suspended and Parks was put in jail to await trial on both assaults. But then we learned something else that cast this story in a very different light. The electronic monitoring in juvenile probation is not a 24-hour monitoring system. You heard right. NBC5 investigates learned that the protocols in the Cook County system called for officers to only make periodic checks with long periods on nights and weekends when the monitoring center was not staffed at all, meaning for long periods every day, it's possible that no one's checking on these kids. So NBC5 investigates continue to ask more questions. And just five days after the attack, Cook County's juvenile probation chief, Rose Golden, told us she was scrapping the existing program and putting the county's electronic monitoring vendor, Sentinel Offender Services, in charge of full-time monitoring in an effort to stop any future walkaways like police say occurred in the Aaron Parks case. Union members say that's not enough they should be given arrest powers to immediately bring in juveniles who have violated their electronic boundaries. And some in the community argue that tighter controls should be imposed on exactly who is allowed back on the street. You have juveniles here committing violent crimes that should have never been out. For the violent offenders who are out on the streets, there are former offenders, peacemakers, who are now trying to set them straight. We'll show you how they're making a difference when we come back.
The front lines that define Chicago's most violent neighborhoods are gang lines, dangerous boundaries that can flare up instantly, even in these winter months. But some former gang members are making a difference, seeing this as the best time to try to break through those lines. Here again is Miriam Brooks. We may not see the same level of crime in the winter, but... Majority of the stuff that happened in the summer times start brewing during the winter times. That's why these former gang members don't stop working to fight gang violence when it's cold. They are two of the four peacemakers who focus on the Southside Auburn Gresham neighborhood. This is their time for them to really try to plan and strategize and their minds get to wonder what can we do once it get warm. So the peacemakers keep listening heading into their homes. Going to their basements, talking to them, letting them know, you know, seeing what's really going on. What's happening on Facebook? What did he say? What happened at the high school? That's when to find out the real beat. Who don't like who? Who might start shooting at who? That's key because according to police, the focal point of violence in the city is gangs. What's driving the violence today, yesterday, tomorrow, it's going to be the gangs. Deputy Chief Leo Schmitz commands the 7th District, Englewood, and according to the police, the gangs are concentrated mostly on the south and west sides. Even though crime is down, even though all the shootings and murders are down, those are still the ones that lead the pack. Why is this gang violence happening? St. Sabina's father, Michael Flager. The people shooting today are punks. They're coward punks. They're not man enough to come say, yeah, it's you that I'm after. I told you, you did this to me. I'm coming back for you. Now it's I stand across the street or I do a drive by and I shoot a spray of bullets. And then there are the factions. Deputy Chief Schmitz shows us a map of gang territories in his Englewood community. There's good people all over here. Even so, most of it is gang territory. The blue, the stripes, the dots, all different gangs and within those gangs, factions. These guys emotional killers, so they react off emotion. His baby mama got slapped. His sister got punched. He gonna react off that. They not even gang banging for no money or none of that. They just say everybody want to be this term a hitter. The police insist they have strategies. And last year in each one of these south and west side districts, crime was down or flat. And the peacemakers feel they're part of the solution, but they're not satisfied. It may be down, but it's not over. We want to put an end to crime here in Chicago. And we end our special report from inside the front lines with a pitch. Our team at NBC5 Investigates is committed to doing the stories that affect you directly. But we need to hear about those issues from you. What affects your neighborhood, your block, your family? We can't do these stories or get these results without you. So if you haven't already, please download our app or go to NBC5Chicago.com and click on the investigations page and send us the stories that matter most to you. Thanks for watching. NBC5 investigates sex trafficking is a growing concern in this country and local and federal law enforcement consider Chicago a hub for activity and experts say what drives that activity is demand. So who is buying sex? NBC5 investigates Marion Brooks went along on a John sweep with the Cook County Sheriff to find out. If John is looking for it, you know, he'll spot them. Mid morning on a Thursday in the rain, Cook County Sheriff's Police make their first arrest. It's a goal. It's a goal. An 83 year old former science teacher. Oh, no, I'm not going to buy it. Minutes later, a 31 year old bakery truck driver. I don't want to touch him. He was busted in his delivery truck. The bakery owners couldn't believe he'd do this at work. They may fire him, and they told us he's married with children. And then there is the 21-year-old college student. I have a girlfriend. I don't need to do this. But one study on men who buy sex suggests that this young man is typical. It shows that 62% of Johns have a regular sex partner like a wife or a girlfriend. The study by the Chicago Alliance Against Sexual Exploitation also found 79% like this young man had attended college, graduated, or had a graduate degree. The 21 year old said he was only joking when he approached the undercover female cop acting as a decoy. And I'm not soliciting anyone. So I mean, I don't know what you just did. It was as, as a joke, but the women who are going through this, who are doing this are oftentimes victims. I mean, I would just get the help they need and see where it would hurt their hurt their self esteem. It goes a bit beyond self esteem. That's often broken long before these women get on the street. Most have experienced abuse. 
Sheriff Tom Dart. So usually sexual abuse started within the home decades ago. Uh, drug abuse as well. All those things are packaged together is led them to where this is the way they're making ends meet. This is a dangerous way to live. We found out how dangerous when we learned about our next John. Dark colored minivan on the deal. I was walking past him and that's when he said, get in the car. This 36 year old man approached an undercover officer we'll call Sue. Usually these guys are somewhat nervous. He was out of the norm. He turned out to be a convicted murderer who in 2004 pleaded guilty to the 1998 murder of a prostitute named Lucretia Avery. He and two others beat her, raped her, wrapped her in a sheet and then threw her out of a window. He served 10 years of a 20 year sentence. Sue wasn't surprised and was glad it was her he tried to stop. I'm being watched because I'm undercover, but if I was actually just a working girl on my own, I wouldn't have any protection. No one's going to come after me. In Illinois, it is a misdemeanor to solicit prostitution, but Sheriff Dart says that charge wasn't changing behavior. It was just sort of getting really just lost in the shuffle and being treated in a way that was uh, dismissive at best. He helped usher in a county ordinance in 2009 that allows a fine of up to $1,000 and it seems to have worked. Since we started doing this about four years ago, we haven't had a repeat offender. And ultimately, keeping the Johns away, fighting the demand, is a big part of the goal. No customers, there's no need for prostitution. The Cook County Sheriff has collected more than $200,000 in fines since his officers began citing Johns instead of charging the misdemeanor. And 60% of that money has gone to a sheriff's fund to help prostitutes get off the street. Marion Brooks, NBC5 Investigates. You may not realize it, but every 24 hours, thousands of women and girls are trafficked or prostituted in the Chicago area. The numbers are staggering, but getting out of that life is very difficult. Experts say the trauma is intense and there are very few services available to help. We found one of them run by the Salvation Army. One top, one bottom, one purse. They look and act like your average teenagers, shopping. These are a good color. But it took work for these girls to get to this kind of normal. They are each victims of sex trafficking. After I got raped, then I started to learn about prostitution. Jackie, will call her, was 13 when she got raped. I was staying with mostly men who would not let me go to sleep when I wanted to and make me have sex with them. At 18, the girl will call Tina, a runaway, was also raped and then moved from house to house, being prostituted by gang members for survival. And they're like, you kind of don't have a choice because if you want to stay in our hood, you owe us taxes, you got to pay us. Jackie, now just 16, was used by two different pimps, managing to escape the last one. I have to wait till you get deep and sick because you just move it and she wake up. And he had guns, so of course I'm going to be scared. She's still fearful he'll come after her. He's capable of anything. Police don't scare him, don't not scare him. Jackie and Tina are safe right now. They're in a long-term residential facility in a home hidden in plain sight in the Chicago area suburb. It's run by the Salvation Army exclusively for sex trafficking victims. It's called Ann's House. Now it looks pretty homey here. Is that part of the way you have it set up, intended to be comfortable? Make it a comfortable environment to make them feel at home. Despite the fact that 16 to 25,000 women and girls are trafficked in Chicago every day, Ann's House is one of only two places in the state offering sex trafficking victims long-term residential care. According to this national survey, there are only 12 beds in the entire state. Ann's House has eight of them and experts say sex trafficking victims need specialized care. The things that you have to deal with, flashbacks and nightmares and defiance. People in prostitution have rates of post-traumatic stress disorder that are almost as high as people in combat war. Here they receive intensive counseling. They learn life skills. We may have girls who don't know how to use household utensils because they've never done it before. They go to school and get constant support. There are rules and structure. And they come into a place that is safe, very structured, where what's expected of them is really clear. Ann Bent, the Ann in Ann's house, donated $1.2 million to fund the program in 2009. What they get in the home is a true home. She sees it working. Right now, Jackie is a sophomore in high school who loves art. Do you see yourself going to college? Yes, I'm going to college for sure, there's no doubt. Without Ann's house? I would probably be in jail right now. I'm not even gonna lie. I could have ended up dead. But this year, yeah. Tina graduated high school and is focusing on college. It's like God spoke to me and said that my life was going to change for the better, and this place represents that. I'm very lucky, her aunt's house. 
More services for sex trafficking victims may soon be on the way. The Chicago Alliance Against Sexual Exploitation has pushed legislation to fine pimps, johns, and traffickers and use that money to help fund services like those at Ann's house. The measure passed last week and now awaits the governor's signature. Now to our ongoing series about sex trafficking in Chicago tonight. NBC5 investigates a boots on the ground rescue effort. The Dreamcatcher Foundation hits the streets on a regular basis to bring support and hope to young women working in the sex trade. Their mission is to get them off the street into a better life. Here's NBC5's Marion Brooks. Hey, pumpkin, you need some condoms? Hey, sweetie, you need some condoms? That's typically Brenda Meyer's pal's opening line, offered with love. She's hoping for trust. This is the first time I've actually saw you, and I'm usually out here. All the girls know me. I used to work right over here. Brenda and her partner, Stephanie Daniels, are on a rescue mission. Brenda spent 25 years as a prostitute, Stephanie 20 years as a drug addict, who at times prostituted to buy drugs. Backgrounds that they say give them credibility to reach these women on the street. We're not here to judge them. No. We're not here to make them change their behavior. We're here to offer them hope and encouragement, and even if they want to stop. This is where I met Marie. I met her right here in a corner. 30-year-old Marie Miller is a former prostitute Brenda successfully rescued in October. And I came along with the dream catchers with Brenda. They gave me hope. And on this night, she is riding with Brenda. I know them, they, that's diamond, butterfly. Over two ride-alongs with Dreamcatchers, we got a first-hand look at the need, wrapped in the story of a girl we'll call Rose in May. My situation right now is kind of messed up, but it's going to get better. Guess what? Mm -hmm. You was by yourself, but you not no more. Give me a hug. <laughs> I'll be you. seeing you soon, okay? And she did, three months later and things yeah. were not better. How's things going? I'm kind of out here on the streets, not have nowhere to go. I'm just bad, I'm out here bad. <laughs> oh, Getting had, all type of stuff. Rose eventually told us that she'd done crack for hours that night and she was homeless. Both Brenda and Marie sense she's in trouble. I can see it in your face, all right? <laughs> yeah. It's gonna get better, you know what I'm yeah, saying? I but what I need for you to do is make a decision if you want to go with me, because that's all I do. You want to go now? Yeah. Want to go now? Ready to go? Are you ready, ready to go to treat? Yeah, I'm, I'm scared. Rose goes along, and we learned she'd been on the street off and on since she was 16. She's now just 22. Brenda first tries to find Rose a bed at a detox center, but none is available. There is nowhere to take her. This dilemma points to a need highlighted in a 2013 national survey of programs for victims of sex trafficking. Despite the estimated thousands of women prostituted or trafficked on any given day in Chicago, there are only 12 beds in the entire state of Illinois and only four beds for victims over 21. It's one o'clock in the morning and a girl says, I'm ready and she's in a bad situation and there's no beds. I just feel like I'm just hearing stuff, seeing stuff. I don't know if it's real, if I'm just seeing stuff. Because she's hallucinating, Brenda brings Rose to the psychiatric ward at Mount Sinai. <laughs> she voluntarily admits herself. In the seven years since they began their mission, the dream catchers have rescued 74 women from these streets, and they've come in contact with either passed out condoms or cards to more than 2,000. But they hope to do more. They're raising money now to open a residential center so they don't have to search for a place for a woman who wants help. They will be that place. And we're gonna do it at Dream Country. We're gonna get these beds, but it takes a village to help these girls. So we need a village to help us. Marion Brooks, NBC5 Investigates. Due to privacy laws, Mount Sinai can't comment on Rose's condition or even if she's still in treatment now. Brenda Myers Powell says Dreamcatchers is only a phone call away if Rose ever needs help again. For more on the Dreamcatcher Foundation, go to NBCChicago.com and search Dreamcatchers. Tonight, NBC5 investigates Division 17. It's part of an innovative program at the Cook County Jail. The program helps women deal with the trauma of, a tra of the sex trade and trying to stay off the street. NBC5's Marion Brooks gives us an exclusive look inside and a warning. Some of the language is graphic. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. This is a special meeting inside the Cook County Jail. Welcome to Prostitution Anonymous, where we learn how not to sell ourselves, right? Right. These women may not be here on a prostitution charge, but they are all touched by it in some way. The danger. Kelly talks about a John with a gun. He hit me in the mouth with the gun about 20 times. 
and broke all my teeth off. I'm dealing with that shame right now. The drugs, which many abuse. Being in a room with numerous of tricks, doing anything to you, you. So you gotta be pretty high to do those things. And what leads to prostitution in the first place? One study of women in the Cook County Jail by the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless found 86% of trafficked and prostituted women have experienced domestic violence. 74% have been sexually assaulted. 63% were victim of some form of child abuse. In another meeting. The first time I prostituted was in the fourth grade. Wow. wow. It's cool, like, oh, you want to give me some money. Right. Yeah. And I, was, I didn't know about prostitution. And even with that said, she's saying it was in the fourth grade. Whose fault was that? The Prostitutes Anonymous meetings are only part of what's called the Women's Justice Program, partially housed in Division 17 of the Cook County Jail. Here, among other programs, women can get GED prep courses, parenting classes, and access to therapy to deal with trauma, trauma that may have led them to prostitution in the first place. You got to start peeling the layers of things that have happened. The young lady said, I started prostituting in the fourth grade. How deep is that? How many layers do we have to pull off that young lady before she becomes new again? This is Brenda Myers Powell. She and Lisa, who only wants to use her first name, are uniquely qualified to help. They're both former prostitutes who now work in the jail to give back. It's important to show the women that I've been there, done that, and that what I'm doing now, they are able to do it too. Recovery is possible. Marion Hatcher is another former prostitute who works with the program. All three also work with the Cook County Sheriff's Human Trafficking Response Team to get to the women who are still on the street. When you offer them the help, and they don't always take it then. Sometimes they take it the next week or even years later. Last spring, this woman was arrested in a sting after posting an ad on Backpage.com. I haven't did Backpage in a long time because I had got raped last year. You got raped by a John? Okay. The goal right. here is not to treat her like a criminal. She's viewed as a victim, and on this day, she accepted the help. She was ready. They call this an intervention, and according to Cook County, 76% of the women offered help in an intervention accept it. And though the numbers aren't as clear in Division 17, there's something happening here. I'm happy. It don't even sound right to be happy to be locked up. I'm learning a lot from this place. And that's the point. The Cook County Sheriff founded the program in 2009 to give these women the tools they need to keep them out of jail. And we want to note that the women in the Prostitutes Anonymous meeting graciously allowed us to videotape them, and they understood they'd be identified. Marion Brooks, NBC5 Investigation. Now NBC5 investigates sex trafficking in our ongoing series. We take you behind your computer and your smartphone to some of the most popular sources for the sex trade. They include the Internet and social media. NBC5 investigates Marion Brooks shows you just how easy it is to use and how quickly it works. Beeping is the alert. Minutes later, the arrest. I'm not here I'm not here calm down, calm down. And then the reaction. I'm dumb, that's all. <laughs> Look, I can't have a grown man sitting here crying. Right, come on, don't, don't do this. In less than an hour, six men had shown up answering an ad posted on Backpage.com soliciting sex. Within minutes. People are calling. It turned out to be a sting. The Cook County Sheriff's Police Vice Unit set up a female officer as a decoy in a random motel room. They couldn't get one processed before others showed up. You got caught, deal with it. After about 90 minutes, they'd cited 11 men. Two had been arrested for prostitution in the past. The volume out there is immense. $45 million worth in 2012, the last year tracked by Ad Monitor AIM Group. 82% of it on Backpage.com. So now you get a sense of the demand side of paid sex and one of the top ways to get it. But what about the supply side? Who is the supplier and how do they meet that demand? More and more these days, it's through social media. Meet Tyrell and Myrell Lockett, twins arrested at age 17 by Cook County Sheriff's Police for trafficking. They were typical predators. They were preying on the weak. They were out of jail in less than two years. And in May, the now 22-year-old Tyrell Lockett was picked up by the FBI, this time on a federal charge of human trafficking. According to the criminal complaint, a major part of his operation, social media. On Facebook, he shows lots of money, guns, and flashy jewelry. His noted job description? 
hip hop artist. Ann worked at Pippin, and the complaint alleges he seemed to cruise the site looking for girls. In several excerpts of exchanges with individuals who were often minors, he would say things like, I just want to say you're sexy, and I got big things set up for us, and describing escorting as easy, fast money, and I'm willing to spoil you. The complaint says Lockett used the come-ons and photos as recruiting tools and often used friends to lure friends. Cook County Deputy Chief Mike Anton. Well, they're promising something that, that uh, a lot of younger people are, are, uh, are trying to obtain. Money, uh, glamour, because they sell it. It took a 20-something to decode this world for us. 22-year-old Arielle Thompson works as an intern for a foundation that helps trafficking victims. She spotted the hashtags on Instagram that outlined a sort of underground world. It's a whole different language. It's like a cyber prostitution ring. We saw one hashtag choosing in the criminal complaint on Tyrell Lockett. Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart, whose vice unit first arrested Tyrell Lockett and conducted the back page sting, says parents need to be aware of all of it. So parents just realize it is horribly dangerous out there. It really is. This isn't me or anybody else trying to scare you. It is real. Backpage's attorney told us it encourages law enforcement's use of its site to battle trafficking, especially in finding victims. Facebook wouldn't comment on Tyrell Lockett's use of its site because his case is pending. But we've put a copy of his criminal complaint and a glossary of hashtag terms on our website, NBCChicago.com. Search sex trade if you'd like to take a closer look. NBC5 investigates inside the front lines. We go inside a crime-ridden West Side neighborhood with an ex-gang member who used to be part of the problem, but now he hopes to be part of the solution. Here's Tammy Leitner. This is Cicero and Van Vrun. This is where me and eight other guys started a street gang called the Cicero Undertaker Vice Lords. Most people in this Austin neighborhood know Clifton McFowler simply as Booney. I never went anywhere without a gun and a bulletproof vest. Armed robberies, drugs, and eventually murder. It was all part of gang life, and it cost him 37 years behind bars. We had no idea that 40 years later, the effects of something that we did as kids will have on my community. This once vibrant community is now plagued by abandoned businesses, boarded up homes, drugs, unemployment, and street gangs. Ah, uh, you finally made one. Booney now spends his days keeping kids like JV and Reed away from gangs. I talk to Booney a lot. The 16-year-old met Booney after he was arrested for having a gun. Why do people get into gangs in this neighborhood? Probably uh, just a life that he was raised by. JV owned served several months of house arrest and now spends his days with Booney here at Build, a program for at-risk kids in troubled West Side neighborhoods. What's your grade point at? The program gives kids in this area a fighting chance and this former gang member a purpose. And I believe that's my punishment, is to come back to my community and to save as many as I can. And that's a good punishment. I can live with that. A staggering number of ex-cons return to Austin when released from prison. That's a tough um, burden on a community. State Representative LaShawn Ford has lobbied for resources to resuscitate the ailing area. Austin is a rich community that lots of people come from that has abandoned the community because of the lack of services. For Booney, abandoning his roots is not an option. I did my time. The time was just a part of it. The big part of it is now coming back to these places where I was part of the problem for so long and being part of that solution. And that means even after his day is over at Build, Booney hits the streets of Austin, counseling kids right there on the street corners. Tammy Leitner, NBC5 Investigates. NBC5 Investigates is a state-funded group home out of control. That's what neighbors and staff in Bronzeville neighborhoods say. NBC5's Tammy Leitner reports. The pop of gunfire can be heard nightly in this Bronzeville neighborhood. Last month, just before midnight, three kids were shot while talking in front of Aunt Martha's group home, a place meant to keep kids safe. They were right in this crosswalk right here. NBC5 Investigates has learned that all three kids were wards of the state and were living at this state-funded emergency shelter. One of the victims, an 11-year-old girl, 
had just run outside. They can come and go as they please. The kids are not supposed to leave Aunt Martha's, but neighbors say many of the young residents come and go all hours of the night. Having kids who have literally no supervision whatsoever, having the access to come out of a state-run facility is an abomination. State Representative Ken Duncan lives next door to the facility, which temporarily houses newborns through 20-year-olds, boys and girls. What time is it right now? Midnight. Duncan recently shot this video. It's midnight mm -hmm. on July 4th. Mm -hmm. And you're hanging out in front of... Aunt Martha's. Aunt Martha's. On Aunt Martha's. It's time for you all to go in. Why? We just got out and here. You're 13. So? Wait, wait. Miguel, he's, uh, he's from the Here's the problem. You can't lock these kids in. That's only allowed at psychiatric facilities and detention centers. This is a short term shelter, which means the kids are not supposed to leave. But state law says if a child demands to leave and is not a danger to anyone, no one can stop him. And in fact, NBC5 Investigates has found police have been called here for runaways 27 times in the last 12 months. But current and former employees we spoke to say there's a bigger problem inside. This was shot inside the facility. Raul Garza heads at Martha's Youth and Service Center. Is this behavior acceptable? from a resident. It's not acceptable, but it's understood. And in these photos, former employees say a resident gained access to confidential client files that were supposed to be locked. We're told the resident read them and destroyed the documents. I'm not aware of it, no. They punch staff, throw things at staff. Aurelia Daniel says she was attacked by residents four times during the year she worked at the home. Multiple other former employees tell us they were also assaulted. Has it become a dangerous situation there? Yes, very much so. So they're going to react and they're going to act out and sometimes engage in physical aggression to express how they're feeling about being there. They're frustrated. These kids may be frustrated and they may have had a hard road, but these kids are wards of the state. Isn't it your job to keep them safe? That's what we do. We succeed in doing that to a great extent. Despite the bad behavior and the shooting, both residents and employees say they don't want the shelter to shut down. They simply want things to change. No kids are unsalvageable. These children all could be helped. They all could be reached. All three kids survived the shooting. Since then, Aunt Martha says it has hired more staff and increased security. The CEO tells us Aunt Martha's is working with the community to resolve their concerns. Tammy Leitner, NBC5 Investigates. The Cook County Sheriff's Office is taking extreme measures to suppress gun violence in Chicago. A new temporary detail deploys deputies from the city to the suburbs. And NBC5 Investigates' Tammy Leitner got an inside look as deputies went after those with arrest warrants for violent crimes. It's 25. Yeah. Deputies right. move in quickly surrounding the house. All right, we got Pat in the back. Oh, Jimmy, stand by. They got him in the back. It takes just minutes to find Maurice Jones hiding in the basement of his mother's home. Turn around, face me. The 42-year-old can now stop looking over his shoulder. Did you know sheriff's deputies were looking for you? Uh, they came by here once before. He has a warrant for DUI, and like many others, he's a repeat offender. I wasn't ready to go to jail right now. That's the truth. Button ready to go to jail. Most of them aren't. The other people that we're looking for. Which is why sheriff's deputies are targeting fugitives with outstanding warrants, going neighborhood to neighborhood as part of a six week special detail to help Chicago police combat gun violence in the city. All right. 120 deputies flood this south side neighborhood, and we see firsthand just how hard it is to find these people with warrants. Can you open the door, please? Deputies check address after address. Hello, it's the sheriff's department. Following leads like a trail of breadcrumbs. Do you mind if you show you a picture, see if you recognize the person? This address was a dead end, but this is by no means the end of the search for this guy. Sometimes it's hard to get a good address, and once we get one, we work it pretty good. As for Jones, his outstanding warrant is for a misdemeanor, but most warrants in these concentrated sweeps target violent criminals, allowing Chicago police to focus their efforts on reducing the city's gun violence. Tammy Leitner, NBC5 News. In the ride along, Tammy took part in. Sheriff's deputies made 33 arrests and confiscated 11 guns. 
When the lights go out, crime goes up. Did broken streetlights play a role in an early morning carjacking that left a woman dead? Tonight, NBC5 investigates the possible safety threat in this Chicago neighborhood. Good evening, I'm Allison Rosati. I'm Rob Stafford. The search is on for a carjacker who stole a woman's car, then hit and killed her with it before ditching the vehicle. A tragedy her neighbors say may have been prevented had the streetlights been on. NBC5 investigates Chris Coffey joins us now from the newsroom to explain. Chris? Rob and Allison, tonight we asked the aldermen and the city tough questions about the area's streetlights. Were they working when the carjacking took place? And what could neighbors do to ease their concerns? Neighbors say South Euclid is often too dark because of non-working streetlights, and now they fear it played a role in a tragedy. If there were lights, yes. If somebody would have seen something. Sharon Bonds was delivering newspapers at 91st and South Euclid early Tuesday morning. Surveillance video shows someone walking past her car at about 5 a.m. Moments later, investigators say a man hopped in the car. Bonds tried to stop the driver, but she was dragged by the vehicle and killed. Residents here say the streetlights were out and haven't been working properly for weeks. I call way up there, it's pitch black. I mean, you can't even see nothing. If somebody is hiding, you can't see them. City records show residents filed three repair requests since June 12th. The city calls some of the requests duplicates, but they confirmed the lights were out. We wouldn't have the break in in cars if the lights were, if there was more visibility out here. Earlier this year, the city commissioned a study to find out the connection between streetlight block outages and crime. We saw that on average there's an association of a 7% increase. Alderman Harris. Eighth Ward Alderman Michelle Harris said she cannot control the lights, but she takes the residents' safety concerns seriously. All outage is really a priority, not just for me, but for the city. So the city will come out pretty quickly. It's like a three-day turnaround. The city says the most recent repair request came in on June 20th. Five days later, they say the lights are now repaired. Now, while Alderman Harris says what happened is horrible, she urges residents to stay vigilant and always be aware of their surroundings.